we're inclined to think, yes, some people have been left behind, but that's because they don't have an education. But this goes back to the 1990s. Bill Clinton had a kind of rhyming couplet. He said, what you can earn will depend on what you can learn. And that seemed almost too obvious to contest. But it's a recipe for failing to respect most of the society. And now, The Good Fight with Yasha Monk. Joe Biden has just picked Kamala Harris as the vice presidential nominee for the Democratic Party. Now, I think this podcast is the right venue to debate her merits or the criticisms that have been made against her. But I do want to say one way, which may seem a little bit straightforward and trite, in which I find myself very drawn to her story. It is that Kamala Harris has an Indian mother and a Jamaican father, that she grew up in a Baptist church in a Hindu temple and is now married to a Jew, that many of the ways in which at least parts of America are genuinely diverse, are genuinely international, and are genuinely cosmopolitan are just part of who she is. There are parts of America on the right that hate that vision of America, that are scared by the demographic changes that she represents. There are also parts of the work of social justice left, which is uncomfortable with the idea of deep connections across racial and ethnic lines. And I've been thinking about this. I think there's a logic for that from within some of the quote-unquote woke worldview. It is that somebody who is white and somebody who is a person of color, or for that matter, somebody who is black and somebody who is not black, will always have differential amounts of power in the world. It is secondly that relationships, and certainly romantic relationships, between people with different levels of status or power are inherently problematic. And when you take those two precepts together, then you get what you increasingly see in parts of the discourse, uh, this idea that is perfectly fine to problematize interracial relationships from the left. Or as a New York Times op-ed put it, that even friendships between people who are black and people who are not black in the United States may not truly be possible. Well, Kamala Harris and everything she is and does is a living, briefing, laughing refutation of that idea. Her parents are a refutation of that. Her marriage is a refutation of that. And I think whatever your thoughts about her particular merits as a politician, those of us who are aiming to build a liberal, multi-ethnic society, a thriving, diverse democracy in which we focus more on the things that we can have in common than on the things that might divide us, should see her success as one of the signs of the America we're fighting for and the world we're fighting for is in fact possible and achievable. Just one more note before we go into the conversation. As I told you, I founded Persuasion, a community for people who are devoted to the ideals of a free society at the beginning of July. It's been a phenomenal success, and we have had wonderful writers who are contributing articles to us. We are having wonderful events in which we really debate the ideas that this podcast was founded to think about in a serious way. We have social events, happy hours, in which we just hang out and people from around the world meet each other to talk and chat and get to know compatriots in this fight for the values of a free society. So please do consider joining us in the community. You can sign up just to receive the emails and follow our events for free, or you can become a paying subscriber to get privileged access to these events, to the happy hour, to the book clubs we have with wonderful leading thinkers of this moment. I really hope to see you there. It's at www.persuasion.community. That's www.persuasion.community. 
persuasion.community. Well, it's really a very special pleasure for me to introduce you to Michael Sandel, even though he doesn't really need any introduction. Michael is the Anti and Robert M. Bass Professor of Government at Harvard University. He's one of the best known and most important contemporary political philosophers. And for acknowledgement, as they say in the biz, he was also my PhD supervisor. So I've known him very well for a long time. Michael has a new book out called The Tyranny of Merit, What's Become of the Common Good. And it makes a really strong case that many of the ways in which we pretend that we live in a meritocracy and some of the ways in which we give huge privileges and advantages to the most successful people in our society are unjustified. Um, I agree with him on many of those themes. I also had some skepticism about whether the solution is to give up on the idea of uh, merit altogether. Is the solution to build a fairer meritocracy that actually rewards people for achievement and still ensures that those who are not at the top of a ladder have a decent life? Or is the idea to think about this category a lot less? That's at the heart of our disagreement, and I think it has made for a really interesting, fun, engaged conversation. Welcome to the podcast, Michael. Good to be with you, Yasha. So I was really excited to get an advanced copy of your book about a month ago, and I planned to read it a few weeks later, just before our conversation. I ended up reading it all in the afternoon, so I blame you for wasting my productivity that day. <laughs> but it's an excellent read, and one of the things that I want to bring out in this conversation that I'm interested in is that I expected to disagree with you. I ended up agreeing with you, but I'm not quite sure exactly about what. Why don't we get started on the broad outlines? So the title of the book is The Tyranny of Merit, and the subtitle is What's Become of a Common Good. We tend to think of merit as something positive, as something good. One of the virtues of our society is supposed to be that we reward merit. Why is merit actually tyrannical? Well, you're right. Merit is a good thing, and meritocracy seems like an alternative to hiring people for jobs based on prejudice or nepotism, or discrimination. Merit seems the fair way of allocating social roles. But meritocracy has turned toxic, especially as it's unfolded over the past four decades. It's turned into a kind of tyranny for the following reason. What meritocracy means today has come to mean is the idea that if opportunities are truly equal, then those who land on top deserve their success and the rewards that a market society bestows on them. And by implication, those on the bottom, those who are left behind, must deserve their fate as well. So meritocracy is not only a way of allocating social roles, it's a way of valuing the various social roles that we need, a way of rewarding them. And it's also a set of attitudes towards success and failure, winning and losing. And these attitudes are what makes meritocracy toxic. For the winners, it induces a kind of hubris. I call it a meritocratic hubris. The winners inhale too deeply of their success. I made it on my own. I earned it thanks to my talent and hard work. And for those who struggle, it induces a kind of humiliation because it enables those on top to say, insofar as opportunities are equal, if you don't make it, you have no one to blame but yourself. And this set of attitudes, combined with the deepening inequality that's unfolded in the last four decades, has made a meritocracy, which, as you point out, Yasha, seems an ideal has turned it into a kind of tyranny, a source of the resentment that has led to the dangerous politics, to the populist backlash, the politics of resentment that we see today. So this podcast obviously is particularly interested in, as we put it in the introduction of the podcast, you know, the causes of populism and how to combat it. So where do you see that link? Why is it that this sense of entitlement that merit can give people, this sense of I deserve to be on top, has led to the rise of people like Donald Trump or like Jair Bolsonaro? 
What we see among the authoritarian populists around the world is a very effective playing to the politics of resentment and humiliation. Liberals and social democrats think that the only problem with the inequality that has deepened in recent decades is a matter of distributive justice. And so they offer a politics that tries to offer a more fair distribution of income and wealth, or at least that's the claim, whether these parties have actually offered such a politics in recent decades is the subject that could be debated. But that's the claim. That's the project. The project is really to say what we want to do is create a level playing field, a fair race, truly equal opportunity, a chance for everyone to rise regardless of their background. And if we can do that, then the race will be fair. Then it will be possible truly to say that those who land on top deserve their place. That has been the politics of the center-left and center-right really over the past four decades. A debate about how to achieve genuine equality of opportunity. And politicians disagree exactly about what that means, how generous a safety net, what sorts of incentives to put in place. The parties debate that. But what that debate misses is that even if we could achieve a society with true equality of opportunity, there would still be the galling sense that the elites look down with disdain on those who are left behind. And one of the striking threads running through the political rhetoric of populist authoritarians is that elites are looking down. And they're not wrong about that. They are not wrong about that. And so I think we need to ask ourselves, why is it the case that over the past four decades, elites have come to look down on those left behind? So to what extent is this about economic policy and to what extent is this about cultural attitudes? Because one of the, you know, I'm quite sympathetic to the importance of economic explanations in the rise of populism. I think there's a strand of especially American political science that wants to write that off completely and say it's all about culture and all about race, particularly Uh, and I'm not quite convinced by that evidence, but there is a problem for those of us who want to believe in economic roots of populism, which is that a lot of the populists, not all of them, but most of them, want to cut the welfare state, give big presents to big corporations and so on. And so it's a little difficult to see how people who are upset over inequality, who are upset over uh, the kind of hierarchical society you describe, should vote for people who will actually deepen that economic inequality. Now, perhaps part of the reason is that what they care more about is that cultural sense of slight. But for somebody like Donald Trump might take some of the money away that actually helps them, might actually put in place economic policies that aggravate some of those underlying problems. He says in the way that was, I think, a little too easily mocked by his opponents, I love the uneducated, right? I don't judge you for who you are. I don't judge you if you just went to high school. I don't have a problem with you if you didn't go to grad school. So is that the heart of it? And why is that so powerful that it overrides the economic interest that people have? But sort of you talked about as well in your previous answer. Right. Well, it's true, Yasha. Some people attribute populism, authoritarian populism, to economic factors, other to cultural factors. I think the source is both economic and cultural and that we draw too sharp a distinction between the two. I think what's really at stake in the inequality that has unfolded is our economic and cultural injuries that are actually hard to disentangle. It's certainly true that almost all of the benefits of market-driven globalization or neoliberal globalization over the last four decades have gone to those in the top 10 or 20 percent, and that the bottom half have received almost none of the economic growth that's resulted over the past 40 or 50 years. So wages of average workers have been stagnant for 40 or 50 years. So of course there is a powerful economic component to the sense of grievance and injustice. But bound up with that is a loss of social esteem, which gets us onto the terrain of culture. It's not only that working people find that their jobs have been outsourced thanks to globalization and that their wages have been stagnant in real terms. They also sense that the social recognition they are accorded, the social esteem, 
the society accords, the work they do, has been diminished as a result of the shift toward the financialization of the economy, the prestige and outsized remuneration of the professional classes. And so they feel left behind, a great many working people feel left behind, not only in terms of jobs and wages, but also in terms of social esteem. The matter of work and the dignity of work is partly an economic issue, but also at the same time, a cultural issue. And the interplay between the two is what gives rise to the grievances, and I would say legitimate grievances, that populist authoritarian figures have appealed to. Now, to be sure, they have not offered solutions to the economic plight of those left behind by globalization. But they have articulated, in a way that the mainstream parties have failed to do, the sense of grievance and the loss of social esteem that ordinary workers sense, and the resentment against elites who inhale too deeply of their own success and look down on those less fortunate than themselves. You describe the emphasis on credentials and the emphasis on, look how I deserve my exalted position in society because didn't I work hard in high school and didn't I get into a great school and didn't I get a good GPA and so on as sort of last acceptable prejudice. I mean, you're teaching at Harvard, you taught me at Harvard, you're around the rising elite all of the time. And, you know, unfortunately, I fear in the nature of these things, a lot of the people who listen to this conversation, a lot of the people who listen to this podcast, probably in a broad sense are part of it at as well. Are people with certain college degrees and postgraduate degrees by and large, are people who, you know, have the time and leisure to listen to an in-depth conversation about philosophy and politics for an hour. Give us a sociological description of our set. I mean, what do we not want to see about ourselves? that you think is pernicious? Because most of the people I know are nice and they're friendly and they care about justice and they care about um, improving the lives of least well-off and they tend to vote for parties who uh, want to redistribute rather than not redistribute. So what are we missing about ourselves when we look into the mirror and see a nice, inclusive, flattering vision of people who are committed to social progress? Part of what liberal elites misunderstand about themselves and their politics is that the message that they are offering and have offered for the past four decades seems generous, but is actually insulting in a way. The message is, if you don't want to be left behind in the global economy, what you need to do is to figure out how to get a four-year college degree, preferably at an elite or selective institution. Now, what could be wrong with emphasizing higher education and improving access to higher education. Well, nothing by itself. I spend my life in this field. I'm all in favor of that. But as a response to inequality, the admonition, get a four-year degree, is bound to leave behind the majority of citizens. Those of us who live our days in the company of the professional classes, can easily forget that most people in the United States, most people in Western European democracies do not have a four-year university degree. Only about a third do, which means that two-thirds of the population have to find work and have to find social recognition and esteem and a sense of belonging without being able to claim the meritocratic credentials that our society has come to prize and put at the center of political aspiration. So what's missing from the political agenda of liberal elites or mainstream parties of the center right and center left is an appreciation of the dignity of work, where work does not mean necessarily having a degree from an elite university and winning a job in the ranks of the professional classes. That's something we miss. We need to reorient our politics, including the politics of aspiration, toward making life better and more dignified and respected for those who won't get a four-year university degree. So that's one respect in which those of us who inhabit the professional classes or who teach in universities 
need to remember that mobility through higher education cannot be the answer to inequality. That's an idea that we find very strange because we, we're inclined to think, yes, some people have been left behind, but that's because they don't have an education. But this goes back to the 1990s. Bill Clinton had a kind of rhyming couplet. He said, what you can earn will depend on what you can learn. And that seemed almost too obvious to contest, but it's a recipe for failing to respect most of the society. And here's one other aspect, Yasha, that we miss. The result of this has been to disempower in democratic institutions, those who don't have a four-year university degree. We forget that almost all members of Congress and the Senate or of the parliaments of Western Europe have university degrees. And we're inclined to say, well, isn't that a good thing? We want well-educated people to be governing. What it means, in effect, is that working people, people from a working-class background, have almost no representation in the parliaments or in the congresses of Western democracies. And this does represent a significant change from the 1930s and 40s and 50s and 60s, when working-class members of parliament or of congress were not in the majority, but had a substantial voice. Now, the educated elites govern the majority of the population who can't reasonably aspire, at least in any numbers, even to share in democratic institutions. It's true in national legislatures. It's even true at, at the state level. And let's get back to the sort of double meaning of the word meritocracy, which I want to come back to. But in some senses, it is the principle that positions of uh, honor and opportunity should go to people who merit them more, whatever exactly merit means in that context. But in the literal sense, right. of course, it means the rule of the meritorious. And certainly uh, on that particular conception of merit, at least, if every member of Congress and every member of the Senate has a four-year college degree, a lot of them, a huge majority of them have graduate degrees, it is a rule by one section of society in a way we tend not to think about. It's not only a narrow segment of the population, relatively speaking, that winds up being represented. The concept of merit, which you've just raised, merit in governing or in ruling, that tends to be promoted and assumed by a college-educated elite class, conceives merit in technocratic terms, merit in terms of technical expertise. But that is a shrunken, diminished notion of merit understood in the broad sweep of political thought. The tradition you were just referring to, Yasha, the idea that the meritorious should rule or should govern, goes back to Aristotle, to the Athenian city-state. But then it did not mean those who have the greatest technical expertise. It meant those who are best at deliberating with their fellow citizens about the common good, best at exercising judgment. And this involves civic virtue. It involves moral character. It doesn't simply involve command of various forms of technocratic expertise. So even in the domain of governing, we have narrowed the notion of what counts as merit to a kind of morally empty or morally neutral notion of technocratic expertise. And this has impoverished a public discourse in ways that I think a great many people find frustrating. So, you know, nobody who's trained in political philosophy as ours uh, by you and others can uh, hear a distinction and resist the urge to introduce further distinctions. So let me put a few Please. distinctions to you. So yeah. one distinction is the one yeah. that I briefly just invoked between two different readings of the principle of merit, right? On one reading of the principle of merit, it is simply that when there are positions of advantage in society, they should go to the people who best married them. And then there's a follow-up question as to what exactly that means. It might mean the people who are likely to do best in that position. If it's a sports team, the person who's most likely to make the team win, it might be a different kind of conception, right? But that's one. Right. On the other side of the ledger, you have a conception of merit, which is much more about who gets to govern, that the people who are in charge should be the people who are most meritorious. Now, I think on the most superficial level, I'm confused about whether your attack is mostly on the first or the second of these prongs. It feels to me that a lot of the book is an objection 
not to the idea that positions of advantage should go to those who married those, but to the idea that those people should get to have as many advantages as they do now, that the rewards that we currently attach to positions of advantage should be as big as they are, and that the tough life circumstances you might experience if you don't have the luck to have one of those positions of advantage shouldn't be as terrible as they are now. And perhaps additionally, the people who end up in these positions of advantage should be aware that uh, in many ways they got lucky to be talented. They got lucky to come from a family where it's easier to end up going to college and grad school and so on, rather than prancing around and telling people, I'm better than you, right? But those are two quite different things. And the reason why I expected to disagree with your book, but ended up not being sure about whether I agree or disagree with your book, Mm -hmm. is that I'm quite committed to the first principle. I'm quite committed to the idea that in at least some circumstances, the person who should get to play on the team is the person who's most likely to make the team win. The person who's supposed to become a doctor is the person who's likely to save the most patients as a doctor. That seems like a very fundamental principle to me. And I didn't end up quite knowing to what extent you do or don't agree with that principle, as opposed to all the other things that wrongly flow from that principle in our society, on which I sort of easily agree with you. Well, the idea that jobs should go to the people who are best able to perform them, to perform in the role, that's an idea that I don't disagree with. Now, there are two reasons we might want to make sure that jobs go to those best able to perform them. One of them is a reason of efficiency or utility. The best uh, basketball player should make the team or the best violin player should uh, be chosen for the orchestra because that will result in the best basketball being played or the best concert being played. But there's a further reason why we want social roles to match people's talents and skills, and that is that it's fair to them to do so. If other factors come into play, then people are being deprived of social roles for which they are well suited, and there's some unfairness or perhaps discrimination or prejudice in play. So far, so good. Now, what these examples obscure is that what counts as merit, what counts as performing the role when it comes to governing, let's say, is open to debate. For Aristotle, the idea of giving people the social roles, the offices and honors and jobs that they deserve, that was at the heart of justice. But when it came to governing, which he was most concerned with in this analysis about how to distribute things, when it came to governing, what counts as the relevant merit or virtues depends on figuring out what is the purpose of the state or the polis or the political community. And if the purpose is just to promote GDP, let's say, if it's purely economic association, then real estate moguls and financiers and economists should be given the most important roles. But Aristotle said, and I think he was right, that that's too narrow a notion of what politics is about of what political community is about. If political community is about something higher, living well together, moral and civic education, figuring out how to create a shared common life that enables all citizens to flourish. If politics aims at the common good, in other words, then the relevant merits to governing include matters of character, matters of civic virtue, the ability to deliberate well about justice and injustice, the meaning of the common good. And that's an argument for a certain kind of democracy, a robust, morally engaged kind of democracy that is very different from the economistic, market-driven, expertise-centered idea of politics we have today. So part of what's gone wrong with meritocracy today is connected to our impoverished conception of what politics is for and the hollowed out political discourse that has come with that and the excessive emphasis 
on narrowly understood technocratic expertise, economistic expertise, which has led us away from the common good, which has exacerbated inequality, which has excluded the majority of citizens from effective participation in democratic governance, and which has generated the resentments we've been discussing earlier, the sense of disempowerment and the straying from the common good. So meritocracy as understood and practiced today is a far cry, this is one of the arguments of the book, from the orientation to the common good and to civic virtue and to moral character and moral argument and deliberation that traditional exponents of governance by merit had in mind. And that's why, hence the title of the book, The Tyranny of Merit. This kind of merit exerts a kind of tyranny because it's so deeply at odds with genuine democracy and, for that matter, with human flourishing. So I agree with much and perhaps most of that. Let me put a very facetious objection to you, which you're welcome to ignore, and then a more substantive challenge. The facetious objection is that I'm not sure that even if your metric is maximizing GDP, putting real estate moguls in charge of government is a particularly good idea. The well, I agree. The last I agree. few years it seems to suggest that's not the case. That's why I said this is a facetious objection. But the most substantive one but is just that- on your facetious objection, there's a counterpart to that facetious objection that applies to mainstream liberals, pre-Trump. And that is, even if you think the common good consists in maximizing GDP, it's a mistake to elevate finance to the uh, centerpiece of the economy and to accord enormous financial rewards and social prestige to people who engage in finance unless you can show that the financialization of the economy in the U.S. and Britain and other places in the last 40 years has actually helped rather than hurt GDP. And there's powerful evidence that it hasn't. And much of the distortion of merit and reward and social esteem in politics and also in the economy, even within the frame of GDP, has to do with the elevation among professional elites and within liberal circles of finance to a role above the Main Street economy. So there's a facetious worry to be voiced with regard to real estate developers, of course, who also happen to be wannabe autocrats, but also to the liberal elites that were the focal point of the uh, ire and resentment of a great many people who turned away from mainstream parties a feeling that both of the major parties in the U.S. had been more or less captured by a a kind of Wall Street orientation. And this goes back to the bailout of 2008, which generated much of this anger and frustration on the right and the left. And it has to do with, even within the frame of GDP, the spurious assumption that finance should be rewarded and valorized as the uh, apex of the elite and of achievement and of merit. And that objection is perhaps less than facetious. But I do want to get back to sort of the original question, the sort of previous exchange we had, because I worry that, again, I sort of asked you about precisely the nature of the role that marriage should play in everyday life, that marriage should play in who gets a job, perhaps who gets a university place. And you defaulted back to the answer about meritocracy understood as a principle of governance of society as a whole. Now, I agree with you firmly on that. I agree with you that a conception where we say that those who have the fanciest postgraduate degrees should rule the country, or even worse, those who have made the most money on Wall Street should rule the country, is clearly not going to serve the common good and the public good on which uh, the American Republic, after all, is founded, of the idea that we are trying to serve something like the common or the public good, even though we've obviously fallen far short of that in our history. So I agree with that objection. But my worry about your book and a few other books that are in this space, what I see as a little bit of a sort of fashionable discourse of trying to bash marriage, is that we might end up with a wrong upshot. Because to me, the upshot of all of the shortcomings of meritocracy, of the rule of merit and the way you outline it, is two things. First of all, that we actually need to give much more role to true merit in individual decisions. That at the moment, the people who end up rising to the top of society are often not the most talented, often not the ones who have most to contribute to society, 
but they are simply the children and grandchildren of people who have a lot of power, of people who have a lot of money, of people perhaps who have been in this country for a long time, of people who perhaps have advantages on the basis of their ethnicity. And a lot of what we need to do is actually to make this country more truly meritorious so that the people who have a lot to contribute can in fact contribute more to the country. And then the second thing I would say is that we need to make sure that we have an economy in which everybody can have a decent life and everybody gets real social respect, in which, yes, the doctor is the one who has most aptitude for a certain form of study and practice. We actually select doctors in a more meritorious way than we do right now. But doctors as a group don't make as much money as they do today and don't have as much social prestige advantage over somebody who's a delivery person or somebody who's a primary school teacher or somebody who works on a construction site than we do today. But I worry that those subjects, as I see them, are slightly obscured when we say, well, the problem is merit, and actually what we need to do is sort of move beyond merit. And I'm not quite sure what kind of society that would build. So if you will, indulge me and tell me whether you disagree with that, where you disagree with it, and if you don't, whether we don't need to rescue merit from the marital traps, rather than saying that we need an attack on merit. Well, it's certainly true, Yasha, that our society falls far short of the meritocratic principles we profess. There is not truly equal opportunity. And we see this, for example, in elite universities, which proclaim the principle of merit, both in admissions and in financial aid policies. And yet, in Ivy League universities and other elite American universities, there are more uh, students from the top 1% than there are from the entire bottom half of the country. So clearly, the meritocratic principles we proclaim in higher education, we fall far short of achieving and improving uh, access to higher education. To everyone, that's an unqualified good, and it's a far from finished moral project. And the same is true with regard to the economy generally. So the project of of providing truly equal access to jobs and university places, we fall far, far short of that. The question is whether equality of opportunity and awarding places based on true merit is or should be the primary ideal of a just society and a good society, or whether it is a remedial principle. And I would say the second, it's a remedial principle. No one should be held back based on a prejudice or family background. And we have a long way to go in avoiding that injustice. But we could succeed, even if we succeeded, in remedying that injustice, it would be important not to mistake the society that would result for a just society. It would not be, nor would it be a good society. And that has to do with an element of meritocracy that is corrosive of the common good. And by this, I mean uh, an element of a true meritocracy that is corrosive of the common good. And that is the idea of desert, of moral deservingness that attaches to the meritocratic ideal. Now, Michael Young, in the late 1950s, he was a British sociologist associated with the Labour Party. He's the one who coined the term meritocracy in 1958 in a book called The Rise of the Meritocracy. And what's interesting is when he coined it, he coined it as a term of not as an ideal, but as a fear. He saw that in the Britain of his day, the class barriers were breaking down. But what he saw was that if one day we had a perfect meritocracy, then those on top would believe they deserved their success because there were no obstacles. They had done it on their own. And those on the bottom would be, as he put it, morally naked. They would have to believe that their fate was their fault. And what he saw is not a falling short of meritocratic principles. He saw the dark side built into the idea of merit, which is the notion of desert, deservingness that goes with it. 
again, I agree with that critique of a society where it would be built solely around the principle of merit. And I can see how... Even if it were achieved, even if it were true. Right. But it seems to me that that is true of many principles to which we are and should be firmly committed. A society whose only guiding principle is freedom or a society whose only guiding principle is equality would equally go wrong, right? In the way we think about society, we normally keep a set of values in mind and recognize the best trade-offs between them and that we need to pursue all of them in so far as possible. Right, but this is not just a problem of trade-offs with other competing values, Yasha. The claim here, Michael Young's insight, and my claim in the book, The Tyranny of Merit, is meritocracy as a political ideal is flawed not just because we haven't lived up to it and not just because there are competing values that we need also to bear in mind. It's flawed in an internal way. The dark side of meritocracy is built into its most alluring, attractive promise, which is that if we can remove barriers to achievement, and if no one is held back, then those who land on top have earned and deserve their place. And that is part of the allure, part of the moral appeal of meritocracy, but it is also one and the same source of the dark side which this notion of desert, which generates attitudes of hubris among the successful and humiliation among the, those who don't succeed. And when the measure of success is defined as it is in our society by the market or the labor market, then it's made all the more pernicious because instead of defining merit in terms of contribution to the common good, we tend to define merit as the ability to cater through the labor market to the desires that consumers happen to have. So there are two, the dark side of meritocracy is connected to two moral defects. One of them is the talents that might enable me to win a race are not my own doing, even if the race is fair and even if everyone is given the same training and diet. Those talents are not my doing in the first place. That's one moral defect in the idea that I deserve the rewards that go with winning the race. The other defect is, if the rewards are based on what the market defines as catering to needs and preferences, we have to examine the moral importance of those needs and preferences. Here, I give the example in the book of Walter White in Breaking Bad. I don't know, did you, did you watch Breaking Bad? I watched Breaking Bad. I love Breaking Bad. Yeah, please. Yeah. Give me all the Walter White references you want. Okay, so you remember Walter White first worked as a school teacher, a chemistry teacher, and he didn't make much money and he wasn't respected much. He even had to get a job working at a car wash to make ends meet. And then, because as a chemist, he really could make this perfectly pure mess, he made millions as a mess dealer. Now, far more than as a school teacher. Now, in terms of the market valuation of his merit or his contribution to GDP, he had far greater merit, made a far greater contribution as a meth dealer, making this pure meth, than as a high school chemistry teacher. But surely we wouldn't say that his contribution to the common good as a meth dealer was greater than his contribution to the common good as a school teacher. So this is the second uh, defect built into the idea of rewarding people based on merit. The first is, my talents are not my doing, they're my luck, my good fortune, my blessing, however strenuously I strive to develop them. And number two, what counts as contributing, what counts as being meritorious, depends in a market society on catering to desires and preferences that people have for education on the one hand, for math on the other, and if it turns out more people are willing to pay more for meth than for education, then that's a second defect. All of which is to say, if you detach merit from a debate about what really is the common good, then even a meritocracy with perfectly equal opportunity, no barriers, would be morally flawed. That's the argument, Yasha. What do you think? 
I'm persuaded by much of it, but I have a couple of concerns that I don't feel you've quite addressed yet. So the first, by the way, is that I think there's a slight flaw yeah. in the lovely analogy to Breaking Bad, which is that actually water White's drug output does not count towards GDP because illegal activity that is not recorded on the books is not actually part of our measure of GDP. So as a critique of our measure of GDP, I think this example doesn't quite hit. Well, if it's satisfying the desires and preferences of consumers, then it should be part of GDP. So it's unfair to fair to him or unfair to the people running the economy that it is. As a matter of fact, it's not, right? The critiques of the measure of GDP is that in all kinds of ways it's irrational. So that if I burn a lot of gas in my car because I'm stuck in a traffic jam, that improves GDP, right? But by the same metric, actually, GDP does not capture legal activity like that of water white. So the official GDP right, statistics, can, at least, it would be reflected. But that's, a, side, but that's, but that's really I mean, it's, it's, it's that's a, minor a side point. point. It's a minor point. You can take 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 the other take another example. The, that makes the I, I, same I kind of point. Get to, I, I the, get the, the point is we have to I make... Think. I think the heart of the discussion is that it seems to me that the same objection that you cast about a single value polity in which all we're doing is to reward merit. And at that, a poor conception of merit, and at that, a reality that doesn't live up to the poor conception of merit, is obviously bad. And I think as a critique of our social reality, it has power as a critique even of a strange utopian or perhaps dystopian ideal of a society in which the only driving principle is merit. It is very convincing. But I think we could create exactly the same dystopia about a society in which all we care about is equality, or all we care about is that you get exactly just rewards for all of the moral choices you make or a society in which liberty is our only concern and we tell people that they don't have to wear masks in Walmart in the middle of a pandemic because the value of liberty is so much more important to us than the value, for example, of public health. So I think any value that I have deep commitments to, including equality, including liberty, you can make look pretty terrifying if you envisage a society in which that value is the only guiding principle. So I just want to sort of pin you down on this question of, in your notion of a more ideal society, in your version of a society that really does serve the public good, you know, how important do you think it would be that the people who end up being doctors are the people who are best able to practice that craft? What role would incentives for people to learn specialized skills that can actually save a lot of people play? Would we have a little bit more respect for some members of society, like, say, doctors, than others? Or would we try and eradicate those distinctions of social prestige as well? So I want to see sort of beyond the critique, if we're envisaging a society in which the public good is served better, what role would careers open to the talents, would true equal, op equal opportunity, would perhaps even the praise of the truly meritorious play, would it be eradicated? Would it play a minor role? Would it play a big role? How would you envisage that society? Well, we see an example during this pandemic. We see an intimation of what such a society might look like when we consider the people we call, advisedly, essential workers. The people on whom we now depend, those of us who can work remotely from home, are people who are not remunerated or particularly respected or honored in our economy and in our society. Delivery workers, warehouse workers, grocery store clerks, sanitation workers, home health care workers. These are among the least remunerated and oftentimes the least respected members of the economy. And yet now we realize we all depend on them. We consider them essential workers. Along with the healthcare workers, we applaud them. We put up banners thanking them. But the economy is not organized. The experience of the COVID pandemic makes this vivid. The economy is not organized in a way that accords them respect and social esteem in proportion to their true contribution, though often ignored contribution, to the common good. So I think short of imagining a utopian society, we can begin very concretely and ask, if we now realize 
that sanitation workers and warehouse workers and grocery store clerks and home health care workers are essential to the common good. And if the labor market seems not to reward them in proportion to their merit, understood as their contribution to the common good, then we need to redesign the economy and the way we uh, allocate wages in a way that does so. And that would argue, for example, for a, a system of wage subsidies where we deliberate democratically about what jobs are not remunerated in proportion to their true contribution to the common good. And we would subsidize collectively those positions. And not only for the sake of paying them more, but also as a way of expressing a social recognition and esteem for those jobs. So this gets back to the earlier part of our discussion, Yasha, about whether the problem is about economics or culture, motivating the resentment and grievances that lead to populist authoritarians. We have to attend to both at once. And this is where I would begin. Now, doctors, you asked about doctors, I think we should value doctors more, not less, relative to people, let's say, who make money engaged in high-frequency trading or high-speed trading. Unless you can show, and we should have a public debate about this, that speculative uh, activities and financial engineering of various kinds really does contribute to the common good more than being a, a pediatrician, let's say, then we should reorient it, reorient the system of reward, economic, but also of uh, esteem, pay, but also esteem, to reflect the fact that, if it is a fact, that a pediatrician contributes more to the common good than a high-speed trader. So now, this will involve controversial questions about what really does count as a contribution to the common good. And what is the common good? But it's a discussion that is shunted aside if we just assume that the common good is defined by GDP in the context of an economy that, given the tax code, gives tremendous support to, let's say, speculative activities, deregulating the financial industry and disempowering unions so that the sanitation workers wind up with a market wage that is way below, relatively speaking, the value of their contribution. My argument is that we need to reorient our economy and our society in a way that takes on substantive moral questions about what social roles contribute to the common good and in what degree, and reorient the system of reward, a monetary, but also in terms of uh, recognition and esteem accordingly. Now, you could say, well, that at a broad level it brings the political economy more in line with merit. Right. I mean, I was just about to say, this strikes me as an incredibly merit-based vision yes. of in that what sense. a good society would look like. Not only yes. would it be based around merit, it would be based around this collective deliberation about yes. whether the delivery worker is more or less meritorious than the person who is helping us to deal with our trash and how much the relative salary should be and how that should stand yes. for the social standing. So right. it sounds to me like you're, you know, going from Michael Young to Michael Sandel, you know, from the dystopia of meritocracy in the wrong sense to the utopia of meritocracy understood in a much more ambitious sense. Yes. So, all right, fair enough. But that would not be a meritocracy in the Michael Young sense or in the sense that we've enacted it in the era of market-based globalization. It would be an, a quote-unquote true meritocracy. Well, it would be a political economy oriented to the common good, and you could say it recasts merit. But it's important to recognize how far this would depart from what we normally understand meritocracy to be, which has to do with desert, because an important feature of having a public discussion about who contributes what to the common good and how we value these social contributions undercuts from the start the assumption that what people make reflects what they deserve. The idea of deservingness. Now, once we detach it from the seemingly natural workings of the, the labor market, labor market as shaped by various political fixes and so on, once we recognize that these allocations 
of reward and esteem reflect a collective debate about the common good, then it's far less easy to assume that I deserve whatever rewards my talents reap in a market society. That notion of desert is undercut. That hubris is called into question. And it's conducive, quite apart from the civic benefits, it's conducive to a kind of humility among the successful that we don't see very often Hmm. today. Because what's at the heart of the tyranny of merit is the hubris that goes with living in a society where one's success appears to be one's own doing and where the rewards I reap, I think of as my due. That's the hubris. That's the meritocratic hubris that this broader notion of contribution to the common good would undercut, and rightly so, because it would remind us that my having the talents that the society happens to need at this moment, the coincidence between my having those talents and the society wanting or needing them, that's not my doing. LeBron James should get the MVP award as the best basketball player, and he should be the most highly remunerated basketball player. But he should also remember, and so should we, that the fact that he has the skills to succeed at basketball at a time when we love basketball is not his doing. In Renaissance Italy, they didn't need or reward basketball players. They cared more about fresco painters. And so there is some humility in recognizing the lucky coincidence that exists between the talents and skills some of us may have and what our society happens to want or need. And so that's the humility that goes with that recognition, the appreciation of the luck that lands the successful on top. This recognition leads to a humility that I think is a healthy remedy to the meritocratic hubris that generates the resentment of elites today. And I think it would make life better, not only for those who struggle under the burden of thinking that their failure is their fault. I think it would make for a better society, even for those who land on top, because they would be freed of the burden and the anxiety and the striving that goes with thinking that where one lands reflects what one deserves. That's the tyranny of merit that we need to lift from the shoulders, not only of those left behind, but even from the self-understandings of those who land on top. So I think the description of this meritocratic hubris is something on which we completely agree in one of the many deep contributions of his book. Just to end this conversation, what can we do politically or perhaps just personally in our own lives to try and overcome this sort of hubris of Merit. You might speak to some policy changes, but actually, in a way, I'm more interested in, you know, how do we catch ourselves? How do we transform our daily habits? How do we uh, not end up being ensconced in a social world in which it's natural that the more educated you are, the better you are, the better the university you went to, the more we should esteem you and all of those kinds of things. How can we start to overcome some of our own mental models that help to perpetuate this hubris of merit that you speak about so strikingly? I would say in two ways. One has to do with social life, ordinary social life. We tend to be more and more enclosed in social relations, and I mean here in everyday life, with people of our own kind, especially where our own kind is defined in terms of class background and educational background. And so it's no accident that the deepest political division today is along lines of educational differences, educational backgrounds. So finding ways to break down the narrow terms of sociability, and this has to do with building out neighborhoods and public places and common spaces that bring people together from different walks of life, different class backgrounds, different occupational backgrounds, and different educational backgrounds. So that's at the level of social life. At the level of personal reflection, who we are and what we care about, 
I think a lively sense of the contingency of our lot in life can open us to a certain kind of humility that can be a counterweight to the tendency, which is reinforced every day in our society, our tendency to think that everything we've achieved is our own doing. This makes it very difficult to think of ourselves in other people's shoes. It makes it difficult to say, there, but for the grace of God or the luck of the draw, or the accident of fortune, go I. So on a personal level, I think we should catch ourselves if we find ourselves believing that our success is our own doing and seek uh, resources for reminding ourselves of the role of luck and good fortune that helped us on our way. Michael Sindel, thank you so much for coming uh, and joining this conversation. Thank you, Yasha. My pleasure. Thank you so much for listening to The Good Fight. Lots of listeners have been spreading the word about the show. If you too have been enjoying the podcast, please be like, rate the show on iTunes, tell your friends all about it, share it on Facebook or Twitter. And finally, please make suggestions for great guests or comments about the show to goodfightpod at gmail.com. That's goodfightpod at gmail.com. This recording carries a Creative Commons 4.0 international license. Thanks to Silent Partner for their song, Chess Pieces. <laughs>